Starting off the countdown, we have Dora the Witch. Now, what can explain the fact that Dora has talking inanimate objects? Well, it may just be because it's a kid's show, or maybe it's because she's actually a witch that can conjure up spells. That one's far more interesting. Now, one of the spells is placed on the backpack and the map so that they can help her along the way. In fact, she's trying to recruit children into witchhood as well. She needs the children's help in order to conjure the spells by chanting along with her. That's why she has those chants, like chanting backpack, backpack to receive the item that she needs. Now, it is said that she also has placed a spell on Swiper. The spell is Swiper No Swiping. When she says that, Swiper will fail to take the item. If he does succeed to take the item, then he always will have to throw it away. So this spell ensures that Swiper can never truly steal anything. Coming in at number 9, we have Dora suffers from dementia. Duh duh Dora, more like duh duh dementia. So Dora is said to suffer from extreme short term memory loss, kind of like Drew Barrymore in the movie 50 First Dates. She's stuck doing the same things every day, and to her, it feels new. But the audience can see the daily repetition of her life. And she's constantly going to be stuck acting and thinking like a child, even when she ages. Now, throughout the episodes, Dora will ask the audience for help and then pause for an uncomfortable amount of time just staring into your soul. In fact, there are no audiences in her world. She's just talking to herself. And that's how long it takes her brain to process new information. Coming in next at number 8, we have Boots is a Trapped Child. Now, if the previously mentioned theory is correct and Dora is a witch, then people believe that Boots is actually a child that she is trapped trapped and turned into a monkey type creature. Kind of like how Yzma turned Cusco into a llama in Emperor's New Groove. So first off, Boots can talk. And secondly, he literally wears boots. If he was a real monkey with opposable type thumbs on his feet, then wearing boots would be extremely uncomfortable. That means that this child is a monkey but still has some of his human features. That's why he can talk and walk normally. Boots is then stuck being Dora's assistant for eternity. Moving on to number 7, we have Dora is in a coma. People believe that Dora is actually in a coma and is imagining everything that is shown in the show. But how did this happen? Well, people theorize that Dora was home alone one day when robbers decided to break into her house. As a result, she ended up getting attacked by these robbers and ended up in a coma. In fact, Swiper is actually a reference to one of the robbers that attacked her. That's why Swiper is always around Dora and stealing items, because her last memory was of her attacker. So now Dora is living in a dreamlike world until she wakes up from her coma. People theorize that she never will be able to, until her parents pull the plug. In our sixth spot, we have Swiper is a human. Now, people believe that Swiper was actually a man who then got turned into a fox. So this theory surrounds the idea that Swiper was once a poor peasant. He wasn't the nicest man, and as a result for his bad behavior, Dora punished him by turning him into a fox. Now, why would Swiper constantly want to steal items but not keep them? Because he just always throws them away right after. Seems like a complete waste of time. Well. What if Dora's backpack holds the potion to turn Swiper back into a human? Now, that would make sense to why he's always following Dora around. He's just waiting for the opportunity to sneak into her backpack and get the potion. He may steal those other items to distract Dora until he has a chance to get what he truly wants. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the cursed backpack. Now, Dora's backpack looks completely harmless. It's literally a bag with a face on it that sings. But Turns out the backpack has a darker agenda. So people are convinced that Dora's backpack is actually cursed. They say that it's some sort of enchanted artifact, maybe even cursed by an old spirit. Like it has the ability to summon a variety of different objects just from a little backpack. Either that or it has the extension charm from Harry Potter cast on it. But anyways, this bag always supplies Dora with a variety of items. Some are useful, while others are said to just be a distraction. The bag is constantly testing Dora's worthiness. If she chooses the wrong item in a bad situation, then Dora could end up dying. But honestly, I think that this is pretty funny. Like in one of the episodes, Backpack asks which item is good to put on boots, scrape knee, and then they give you options like rope, a band-aid, an umbrella, scissors. Like yeah, just I'm gonna take the umbrella and put it on the cut. And it's kind of funny. In our fourth spot, we have the theory that Dora has schizophrenia. Dora spends her days roaming around, going on adventures that she is completely making up. But she's convinced that everything she sees is all real. 
This includes a blue bull, a light purple and yellow monkey, and a giant red chicken. Ever notice why the animals are all unusually colored? Well, it's because Dora is delusional. She imagines that her town is a rainforest and that she can talk to animals and inanimate objects. In fact, Boots is said to be one of her doctors. He follows Dora around observing her behavior and makes sure that she doesn't get into any trouble. But Dora imagines Boots as a monkey that wears boots. Dora is also never seen going to school. Well, that's because her case of schizophrenia is so severe that she can't go to school. Moving on at number three, we have Dora is suffering from a terminal illness. Poor Dora, apparently she hasn't got a lot more time to live. So this theory revolves around the idea that Dora is very sick and her adventures are all in her imagination. So Dora is said to be so sick that she isn't allowed to leave her house. She suffers from an illness that causes a child to be born with a big head, which explains why Dora's head is unusually large. Now, as a result of her sickness, she isn't allowed to leave her home. The adventures that she goes on are just the stories that she makes up from playing with her toys. Her toys are a stuffed animal fox and a monkey and the doll that she considers herself. She wishes that she can be adventurous and brave so she just created this doll as someone who she wants to be. Now, she made her stuffed animal fox the personification of her illness because her illness is literally swiping away years of her life. In our second spot we have Dora is an undercover spy. Hard to believe that this little 8 year old girl could be a spy. but. There are a lot of reasons why people believe it. So people believe that this show takes place in the 1960s. This was during the Cold War when there was the whole Cuban Missile Crisis. Now people believe that Dora is assigned to find out information on the nuclear missiles in Cuba. Dora, as in D-O-R-A, is said to stand for Designated Operative Recon Agent. Now Dora is always seen on specific established paths. She never actually explores unknown locations. That's because she already knows where she needs to go. And her talking map? Well, it's a reference to her GPS that is guiding her where to go. And then we have the monkey boots. Well, boots is a reference to the military term boots on the ground. It refers to the individuals who are currently fighting in a war zone. Nice try, Dora, but we figured out your true identity. And in our number one spot, we have Demon Swiper. So, of course, one of the most well known characters is Swiper the Fox. Every episode, he gives Dora a hard time, steals her items, and then throws them away. And of course, you have the famous line Swiper, no swiping. Now, people have a theory that Swiper is actually a demon. They believe that he is an evil spirit in a form of a fox that's goal is to cause chaos on Earth. In fact, people have made the connection between Swiper and the story of Life of Leo by Rodolf Folda. In this story, a nun loses the church key and feels guilty for being negligent. However, the head nun believes that it was stolen by a swiper demon. Eventually, they find a dead fox at the church door with the key in his mouth. They say that Satan had transformed himself into a fox and had stolen the keys. They ended up defeating him by praying. Okay, so who else do we know that is a fox that steals? Swiper. That means the phrase swiper no swiping is a command that repels swiper so he can't steal. Therefore, Swiper is a demon. Number 10, West Cutting. It's almost as if they wanted fans of the film to like hunt them down and like host a barbecue outside in the parking lot. In both Toy Story 2 and 3, their old address of 1001 West Cutting is tucked away where you'd least expect it. In Toy Story 2, there's an ad for Al's Toy Barn and the address is 1001 West Cutting. And then in Toy Story 3, there was a sign above Andy's door that says the same thing. We get it, we know where you live now, except they have since moved to Emeryville and we know that because they have a reference to that in other films like Cars. I wonder if the studio has ever worried about people figuring this out and storming the castle to show their love. I'm pretty sure they'd welcome it. They'd be like, ah, oh, cool, you found us. Here's the golden ticket. We're gonna put you in the next film. That'd be cute. Number nine, AI spiders. Animation in itself is like a painstaking process. Having to draw intricate lines, layers of animation with subtle changes is a tedious process. Pixar didn't wanna add any more stress to the team by having to create intricate little cobwebs in the corners of one of their scenes. But what they did to solve the problem is kind of terrifying. Technical director Hasuk Chang created AI spiders that were designed to weave the webs just like real spiders. All the animators had to do was tell the spiders where they wanted the webs to be and off they'd scatter. Without the spiders it would have taken animators several months 
months to create the webs because they'd have to do one strand at a time. So whenever you watch the film, keep an eye out for cobwebs and remember that they were created by real computer spiders. Does that make it kind of terrifying? Yes. Incredible? Absolutely. Number eight, the new buzz. The amount of thought that goes into every Pixar film is one of the biggest reasons as to why the Toy Story series is just that good. They don't miss a thing. When Woody is first introduced to Buzz in the first movie, by way of the angle, we know that Woody isn't exactly buzzed to see a new toy join the group. After all, that is the whole point of the first movie. So Pixar knew this shot would be important later when they introduced Buzz to a newer version of his toy self. Buzz then goes on to personify the internal battle of what we all endure within ourselves against the person we want to be and the person we are. Can we be better? Or is the battle simply about realizing that we, with our peeling labels and scuffed plastic armor, have always been enough? Number seven, Clue. This next one is scary brilliant. This is honestly going to change the way I watch Pixar films going forward. I've never seen this one, so this one was so fun to hear about. Seriously, like, like I was sitting in my chair and guffawed when I saw this. During this scene, in Toy Story 2, when Ham is laying out the mission for tracking down Woody, he is standing on one of the best Easter eggs ever. Of course, Ham uses the board game Clue to discuss a detective mission that will put these toys to the test. Imagine being in the writer's room for that. They must have had an entire team dedicated to coming up with iconic Easter eggs. I'm a speechless. This is perfect. If you're curious and you have Disney Plus or you have the movie, the timestamp is 18 minutes and 31 seconds and you'll see it. <laughs> Brilliant. Number six, what happened to Sid? For anyone who was around when the first Toy Story came out, Toy Story 3 was an emotional journey to say the least. It was supposed to be the last film and believe me when I say there wasn't a dry eye in the audience. And then of course they made a fourth movie. So it was a little like anticlimactic. Kind of. But I'm sure I wasn't the only one who was wondering, what happened to Sid? Well, when the toys were accidentally tossed into the trash pile, Sid nearly becomes the terrifying antagonist again. He is indeed the garbage man! You can tell due to the nostalgic skull t-shirt he wore in the first film, he's wearing it again while he's like dancing out to beats while he's doing his job, having a great time. I'm glad he found success. Good for you, Sid. Doing some good for your community. But looks like he just can't help nearly ruining the lives of these toys. Glad he never got away with it though. Number five, foreboding future. Another really popular film in the Pixar realm is Wall-E, about a robot left behind after we humans destroyed the world. It's also a really cute love story and it makes my heart go, mm. Despite Wall-E being adorable, it also depicts a terrifying image of our future. This next Easter egg hints at a darker future for our lovable Toy Story world. The batteries that fuel our beloved Buzz Lightyear are the same brand, the By and Large Corporation, which is the same company that created Wall-E. BNL created Wally -E to clean up planet Earth, and they also created the same batteries that fuel Buzz. It's a terrifying thought that among the trash Wally -E cleans up is one of our beloved toys forever without a home. Number four, so many Andes. I honestly didn't think this one was true until I went back and watched it and yeah, it's pretty terrifying. When the kids are arriving for Andy's birthday in the first movie, about 10 minutes in, you can't tell which one's Andy because they're all Andy. Every single one of them is Andy except for the one kid by the staircase in the blue hat. The rest of the kids are all like carbon copies of Andy. Short buzz cut hair, round headed ball caps. Andy is the one with the woody hat. But I guess in an effort to save some time, they decided to press copy paste and save time on editing. Is this some kind of nod to the fact that some kids just look the same when they are that age or was it just a way to save time? Don't believe me? Time for a rewatch and check the scene at 10 minutes in. Number three, always alive. The reason I think Toy Story is so successful is that as kids, toys are some of our best friends and we give them life. Whether during an hour playing Barbie or in 10 minutes before bedtime, they were alive to us. In the Toy Story films, the toys are sentient beings, meaning that while we look away, they move, feel, think, just like we do. But when we play with them, they are just that, toys. That was the kind of rule the film established. But during the film, viewers notice a subtle breach in Woody. In one scene while Andy's playing with Woody, there are unexplained adjustments in his facial expressions, and we aren't sure why, which viewers found a little disturbing. Number two, The Shining. One of the studio's core directors is Lee Unkrich, who has been involved with many of Pixar's heavy hitters, including Monsters Inc., Finding Nemo, and 
Toy Story. He also happens to be a massive fan of The Shining directed by Stanley Kubrick. He's even made a website dedicated to it, so it should be no surprise that he added in a few easter eggs to pay respect to his favorite film. The most famous easter egg is the carpet in Sid's house which mirrors the carpet featured in the hallway of the film. I just watched The Shining for the first time this past winter, ok? There's lots of movies to catch up on. And I was extremely creeped out by Danny's imaginary friend Mr. Tony. Well, Lee finally brought Mr. Tony to life, sort of, by making the janitor at Sunnyside Daycare Mr. Tony. And last but not least, if you are still with us guys, make sure to give us a like, comment and subscribe and let us know what you think so far and drop in any hints of what you've seen in the past watching Toy Story. Let us know. Number 1 Lost Story Did you know Toy Story 2 almost didn't happen because it got deleted? <gasps> About a year before the final release of the film, they were looking back at the file directory, saw 40 files one second and then 4 the next. All hearts stopped in the office that day as 90% of their work was deleted and they didn't have a backup at the studio. Luckily, one of their employees was working from home after they had just given birth, so she had copies at home of the film so she could work. This blockbusting mistake was a result of a faulty code which they referenced in the film itself. RMRF was the code that caused the mass destruction of Toy Story 2 and they set it as the license plate on the car that takes away Bo Peep in Toy Story 4. So that was kind of confusing but you get what I mean. Starting off this countdown we have the lost episode. Now there are tons of apparent lost episodes out there. You got the creepy ones from Spongebob and Mickey Mouse and now Paw Patrol. So according to the narrator, one night they were staying up late to watch Nick at night. But around 2 in the morning, Nick announced that coming up next was a new episode of Paw Patrol, which he thought was weird because why would they release a new episode at 2am when all the kids are sleeping. Anyways, as the episode began to play, he noticed something very strange about it. The episode began with the pups all depressed. Turns out Ryder had died and they were at his funeral, after which the pups got placed in foster homes. But before Skye and Zuma even made it there, they took their own lives. They rather die than be in foster care. Eventually by the end of the episode, all the pups were dead. They had hung themselves with nooses. The episode ended with this saying, life is death and death is life. We all cherish life no matter the cost. Ain't that creepy. In our ninth spot today we have the dark side of Chase. Now here's another apparent lost episode from Paw Patrol. This time the episode started off fairly normal. That was until Chase decided to take a walk in the woods. While out for his walk, someone ran up to him and stabbed him with a needle. Upon being injected with this mystery serum, his eyes turned red and his teeth and claws grew sharp. That's when the horror started. Chase returned home only to kill all of the pups in sight. One after another, he slaughtered his friends, until he was surrounded in a pool of their own blood. Dun dun dun! In our 8th spot today we have the CIA experiment. Now a lot of people are confused about this show. They're like, how does a kid, Ryder, have access to all this high tech equipment and how come he's basically running this town and where are his parents, ok? Well that's where this theory or legend comes into play. Theory goes that Paw Patrol is really a massive CIA experiment. One in which they successfully managed to create super soldier dogs. Now let me explain. The CIA has been operating on a number of dogs for years. Finally, they had a successful batch of mutated pups. The experiments allowed them to become intelligent beings and enabled them to speak English. In fact, we can't really call them pups because they were genetically engineered and grown in a CIA lab. The experiment was called Operation Soldier Paw. The end goal was to create dogs that would become soldiers that are 100% loyal to their commands. The theory continued on saying that Adventure Bay is actually a CIA site designed to train, test and observe the pups behaviors. Eventually they will be turned into the government's slaves doing anything that they wish. In our 7th spot we have the brainwashing. Since 2014 Paw Patrol has earned 8 billion dollars in global retail sales. That's not including what they make off of their episodes. Now there's a theory out there as to why the show is so successful. And that's because it's brainwashing kids. Here's a perfect example submitted by a mother whose son is obsessed with
with Paw Patrol. So she claims that her son will only eat Paw Patrol cheese strings. To him, he says it tastes way better than other cheese strings. So to trick him, she bought no name cheese strings and then just slapped on a Paw Patrol sticker. And her son willingly ate it and said that it was delicious. But previously, he had eaten the no name cheese string and said that it tasted bad. But as soon as he knows that his Paw Patrol cheese string, it's better to him. If that's not some weird brainwashing, then I don't know what is. All these kids are being trained so that their life revolves around Paw Patrol. Paw Patrol toys, videos, and food. They're becoming consumerists at a young age and they don't even know it. In our sixth spot today, we have the AI simulations. Here's another wild theory that someone came up with for the show. Not me, guys. I don't come up with these theories, okay? Some believe that the reason why the pups can talk on the show is because they're living in an AI simulation. So nothing is real. The human characters are real, but the pups aren't. And the situations they put themselves in aren't real as well. It's just all made up. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the hidden agenda. A number of parents have argued that Paw Patrol has a hidden agenda. They are promoting an authoritarian type state. In the show, the leader of Paw Patrol is a male police dog named Chase. Chase is subservient to his boss, Ryder, and authoritarian towards the other pups. On top of that, everyone behaves and does as they're told. Not only that, but Chase's only qualification is that he's a police dog and that's what gave him authority. So it makes it seem like the show is trying to tell kids that police are the main authority figures in society and should not be questioned. You do as they tell you to do and you never question their actions. So Paw Patrol is a way to try and get kids to grow up bowing down to police, to try to avoid outbursts towards the police. In our fourth spot today, we have the gender stereotypes. So not only is Paw Patrol promoting authoritarianism, but it also promotes Promotes gender stereotypes. This can be seen clear as day with Skye. Skye is depicted way different than the other pups. Her uniform is hot pink and it's smaller than the others, and her eyes are pink as well, and she's got long eyelashes. During the first season of the show, only one of the seven Paw Patrol team members was female, emphasizing that women can't have a helping role in society. As we know, jobs like construction workers, firefighters, and police are typically male dominated jobs, and people argue that shows like this aren't helping this cause. Furthermore, someone pointed out that in season two, another female pup gets added to the cast. Her name is Everett and she's physically bigger and her costume is gender neutral. However, she only appears in half of the episodes and does not live with the rest of the Paw Patrol pups. This sends the message that in order to be accepted into the workplace, a woman must take on a more traditional female appearance. So this is why people think that the show is damaging for kids to watch. In our third spot today, we have the predictive programming. Now I've talked about this briefly in another video before. But basically, predictive programming is a theory that the government or people of power are using movies, shows, even books to prepare us for the future. So that when an event happens in the future, we're desensitized to it because we've seen it before in the media years before it actually happened. Here's an example. In season two of Paw Patrol, which was released in 2014, Chase transitions into an intelligence officer. He's got all these spy gadgets like surveillance drones that he uses to track other characters. Well, only a year after season two was released, Edward Snowden exposed how the government was spying on citizens in the US. Not only that, but around 350 police departments across the country have purchased drones for surveillance purposes. So legend goes that these episodes and Chase's career change was done on purpose, for if the government was exposed, people weren't as shocked. In our second spot, we have the predictive programming part two. Here's another Another potential example of Paw Patrol using predictive programming. In 2014, the same year that Paw Patrol decided to give Chase a drone, the Obama administration used drones to kill 1,147 people. Children are being raised to believe that the use of drones is a normal part of society and using them to kill people is okay. Chase uses them, so it's okay for the government to use them as well. And in our number one spot today, we have Ryder is dead. Legend goes that Ryder may be dead and everything that is happening happening in the show, he's just making up. So someone on Reddit created this theory. Apparently, Ryder passed away from a sickness during his childhood. Maybe he wasn't able to do much as a kid because he was sick. So now he's in a better place where he can go on the adventures he never had when alive. Additionally, 
He loves dogs. I mean, who doesn't? So in heaven, he is constantly surrounded by dogs. This also explains why there is an insane amount of money invested in the equipment that they're seen using. Other people believe that he isn't dead, but he's just in a coma and he's dreaming about all this. Starting off this countdown, we have the lawsuit. Back in 2014, an Italian woman named Gabriella Capra actually sued Peppa Pig demanding 100,000 euros. Why? Well, take a look at her last name, Gabriella Capra. Her last name translates to goat. In one episode, Peppa's family visits Italy and meets a character named Gabriella Goat. As a result, this Italian businesswoman has been constantly teased and made fun of for her name. Now, I don't know the outcome of this lawsuit, but she was pretty adamant on receiving some sort of compensation for the suffering she endured. Making our way down the list at number 9, we have the Peppa effect. So I mentioned this in my other video, but oh my, kids are going oinkers for Peppa. And I mean quite literally. Parents have reported that their kids are copying Peppa's mannerisms. They called this the Peppa effect. Basically, kids were talking with slight British accents and were even making snorting noises. But not only that, they were also copying her disrespectful behavior as well. Parents reported saying that their kids were being more defiant and having bad attitudes after watching the show. A research study also proved that this show was making kids lose their capability of developing empathy. So yeah, kids were literally turning into Peppa. In our 8th spot, we have the unrealistic expectations. What not a lot of fans know is that the team behind Peppa Pig was actually in a dispute with the UK National Health Service. They claimed that the show's medic, Dr. Brown Bear, was sending mixed messages to families. They argued that it set unrealistic expectations for doctors. In the show, Dr. Brown Bear makes house visits for minor sicknesses and prescribes medicine for every little thing. In fact, in one episode, he makes an urgent home visit when George has a facial rash. Then the doctor gives him medicine to help. They say that in reality, a rash would most likely clear up on its own. So now they are concerned that it's sending the wrong message to parents, who will then be disappointed if they don't receive the same treatment. Moving on at number 7, we have the stereotypes. Mothers are particularly concerned that Peppa Pig is negatively stereotyping females. In the show, Peppa is super girly. She wears a red dress and loves dolls, which isn't a problem. What's problematic is the fact that she refuses to do boy stuff, as she claims. They believe that the show is enforcing gender roles. They have an emphasis on what boys can do versus what girls can do. They are scared that the show is reinforcing the stereotypes that we are working hard to get rid of, and that the show is disempowering women. Making our way down the list at number 6, we have the cocaine problem. Peppa Pig World is a huge amusement park attraction filled with fun games, rides, and even cocaine. Yeah, you heard me correctly. At Peppa Pig World, large amounts of cocaine were found. This park attracts about 1 million visitors per year, thousands of the visitors being little kids. It's said that people were doing this drug in the baby changing areas as well as the bathrooms. In fact, traces of the drug were found in 4 out of the 7 bathrooms, meaning it was being used all over the park. An investigation was conducted after a Peppa Pig lunchbox was packed with this substance. Police went through the park using a wipe that will turn blue if it comes in contact with this drug. The bathrooms tested positive, which is sad. The attraction is filled with little kids who could potentially come in contact with this substance. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the bad role model. Parents everywhere are appalled at Peppa's bad behavior and ban their kids from watching the show. They believe that Peppa is a terrible role model for their children. Well, let's look at some of the reasons why this might be. For starters, Peppa is rude to her friends and is very disrespectful towards her parents. She often insults her dad, making fun of him for his old age and for being overweight. She also bullies around her little brother. And of course, she's famous for her sassy, snarky comments. Not only that, but the show promotes other unhealthy habits, like how George hates vegetables but loves chocolate cake, and he will often throw a fit when he doesn't get his way. In our fourth spot, we have the explicit toy. Back in 2015, a Peppa Pig educational toy was teaching children to swear. The toy was the Peppa Pig Fun and Learn tablet. It's used by children to help improve their speech. 
but in one case, it taught a three-year-old boy named Amari Black to swear. After playing with the toy, he was saying words like, thank you, please, and F you. The toy was said to have malfunction and was repeatedly saying that profanity over and over again. Amari's mother claims that he is saying it constantly, even after telling him that it's wrong and that he should stop. Moving on to number three, we have the safety drama. Peppa the Pig was once a rebel with no care for her safety or the law. In early episodes, Peppa and her family were never seen wearing seatbelts in their car. It was setting a bad example for kids. One mother wrote to Nickelodeon to say that her daughter had refused to wear a seatbelt because she wanted to be like Peppa. As a result, those episodes have been reanimated, so they are now seen wearing their seatbelts. However, when Peppa is biking, she isn't seen wearing a helmet, which is another concern for parents. In our second spot, we have the fake episodes. Due to Peppa's popularity, a bunch of individuals have managed to give the show a more dark and disturbing twist. Multiple YouTube videos have been made to look like a typical Peppa Pig episode, but in reality, they are filled with horror. In one episode, Peppa Pig goes to the dentist and has her teeth ripped out. Then she ends up with an ax wedged in her head. There's another episode where Peppa just goes psycho and kills her whole family. What's scary is how parents were playing these videos for their kids thinking it was just a typical episode. Other people were slicing images of Momo into other Peppa episodes. The video would start as a typical Peppa the Pig episode, but halfway through, Momo would appear and would tell the child watching to do tasks like take pills, chug bleach, turn on the gas, or cut themselves open with a knife. In one case, a child did grab a knife and start cutting their hair. Thankfully, their parents stopped them before they did anything else. And in our number one spot, we have the banned episode. Now, there are multiple episodes of Peppa Pig that have been banned for various reasons. One of the more controversial ones was an episode called Mr. Skinny Legs. The episode was banned in Australia back in 2012. So in this episode, Daddy Pig is teaching Peppa not to be afraid of spiders, claiming that they're harmless. The spider, Mr. Skinny Legs, ends up being Peppa's friend. She tucks him into bed and offers him a tea. But a mother complained about this episode saying it's giving kids in Australia the wrong message. So I'm sure we all know that Australia is filled with scary insects. In fact, they are known to have quite a bit of scary spiders, including the Australian tarantula that has been seen eating birds and are poisonous enough to kill dogs. The Australian redback spider whose bites can cause serious illnesses and has even caused deaths. And the Sydney funnelweb spider. Their fangs are larger than Australian brown snakes. In fact, their fangs are strong enough that they can pierce through toenails and fingernails. Their venom is so powerful that it can attack the human nervous system and can mess with our vital organs. So parents were concerned that this episode would cause children to let their guard down around these spiders, which in turn could harm them. Mm -hmm.